Thank you for coming today. Um, in the course of this webinar, I want to talk about four topics. First, how are climate and sea level changing in New Jersey? Second, what's driving the sea level change? Third, um, what can we anticipate for the future here in New Jersey? And fourth, what do we do about it? So how are climate and sea level changing today? Well, let's start with some context. For over 800,000 years, carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere, which will be shown here on the y-axis, has stayed between about 180 parts per million during periods we call ice ages and 300 parts per million during warmer periods that we call interglacials. In 1913, carbon dioxide concentrations surpassed 300 parts per million for the first time in over 800,000 years. And in spring 2014, they surpassed 400 parts per million for this first time in what was likely about two or three million years. Let's take a closer look at that. So here we're zooming in from the last 800,000 years on the last side to since the period since 1750, since the start of the Industrial Revolution. So in 1750, prior to the Industrial Revolution, carbon dioxide concentrations in our atmosphere were around 277 parts per million. By 1850, they had risen to about 287 parts per million, about 10 parts per million increase. And they rose by about the same amount in the next 50 years. Between 1900 and 1950, we rose by a little less than twice as much to 311 parts per million. And then between 1950 and 1988, they rose by 40 parts per million, between 300, from 311 parts per million to 351 parts per million. And 1988, mind you, um, was a time of the first congressional hearings in the United States on climate change. So this was when climate change really started rising to the policy agenda. The rise has continued since then, since 1988, in the last 32 years, we've seen about a rise of about 60 parts per million, from 351 parts per million to 411. In other words, about as much as a rise from 1800 to 1988. The majority of the increase above pre-industrial levels has happened since the mid-1980s. And why? Well, it's a pretty simple story. The reason why most of the increase in carbon dioxide levels has happened since 1988 is because most of the fossil carbon dioxide ever emitted has been emitted since 1988. This plot here is showing you cumulative fossil carbon dioxide emissions from 1750 to whatever year you see on the horizontal axis in billions of tons of carbon dioxide per year. And for reference, global emissions in 2018 and also in 2019 were around 42 billion tons. So between 1750 and 1850, there were about 5 billion tons of carbon dioxide emitted. Between 1850 and 1900, about 45 billion tons. So between 1750 and 1900, you got about as much emitted as we now emit in a typical year. Between 1900 and 1950, cumulative emissions rose about fivefold to almost 200, to about 230 billion tons of carbon dioxide. And between 1950 and 1988, cumulative emissions got up to 750 billion tons. Again, the time of the first sort of congressional hearings on climate change. Since 1988, we've experienced more than just as that much rallies in the last 32 years. So since 2019 to 2019, we've experienced a cumulative amount of carbon dioxide emissions of about 1,610 billion tons. As a result of this increase, in emissions, these cumulative emissions, our planet is running a fever. This figure here is showing you average annual global average temperature uh, since 1880. And the key thing to pull out is that from 1980 until 2018, global average temperatures has risen at about 0.3 degrees Fahrenheit per decade, leading us in 2018 and again in 2019 to an average global temperature of around 1.1 degrees Celsius or 2 degrees Fahrenheit above the late 19th century average and making the last five years most likely the warmest on record. Temperatures are rising in New Jersey faster than the global average uh, for a number of reasons, one of which is that the, simply the land everywhere is warming faster than the global average, the other which has to do with changes um, in ocean circulation off our coast. In New Jersey, average annual temperature is now about 3.5 degrees Fahrenheit higher than it was at the beginning of the last century. And these changes are just one indicator. The one we're going to focus on today is sea level 
Since the early 1990s, scientists have measured changes in the height of the sea surface almost all around the world using satellite-borne radars, like the satellite shown here, and basically bounce the signal off the top of the ocean and, and measure how long it takes for the signal to come back. And then you go around the world and you build up a large database of this by, look, by pat doing all of these passes around the world. One of the things satellite data tells us is that sea level is rising at different rates in different places. This map from the fourth national climate assessment shows you the change in the height of the sea surface from 1993 to 2015 um, over the area that includes the U.S. and its overseas territories. And what you can see here is that there's some places, uh, like the North Atlantic here and over here in the Western Pacific, that have experienced extremely rapid rises, in some cases as much as four inches per decade over this time period. Well, there have been some areas that have even experienced a sea level fall over this time period. But the global trend is clear. Global average sea level is rising at an accelerating rate. In the early 1990s, global average sea level was rising at about one inch per decade. Now it's rising at over one and a half inches per decade. And we can place this in a longer term context by using statistical and physical models together with geological records and observational data sets called tide gauges from around the world. So here on the left is a picture of a Rutgers team collecting geological data from a salt marsh. So the idea here is you take a sample of sediments from the salt marsh, you look at the fossils in the salt marsh, they tell you where the tidal zone was when that layer of sediment forms. And when you combine that with things like carbon-14 dating and other indicators of age, you can reconstruct a local record of sea level. And records like tide gauges, this is a picture of the battery tide gauge in New York City on the right, which is basically just a stick in the ground um, with uh, something that floats and it measures the height of the thing that floats relative to the fixed point in the ground. Um, and then it has solar panels to do things like record and transmit the data. When we piece together 3,000 years of geological records and tide gauge data, we get a curve like this. So this is our estimate from the Rutgers group of global average sea level change uh, over the last 3,000 years. And what you see from this is something that Barack Obama tweeted about when we first um, did this analysis in 2016. We are currently seeing the fastest rates of sea level rise in nearly 3,000 years, and new data, new more geological records since our 2016 paper can give us very high confidence that indeed we're seeing the fastest rate of sea level rise in over 3,000 years. And as we already saw, the ocean is not rising at the same rate everywhere, and it's rising even faster here in New Jersey than it is in the global average. This figure here is from um, a report that I hope many of you may be familiar with um, that we put out at Rutgers at behalf of uh, NJDEP last year called New Jersey's Rising Seas and Changing Coastal Storms. So this was a result of an assessment panel that I, I um, chaired. Um, and this figure is showing you, uh, oh, since 1910, global average sea level change in black sea level change at the Battery in New York City in orange, and sea level rise in the Jersey Shore has recorded in the Atlantic City tide gauge in green. Punchline, since 1911, sea level in coastal New Jersey has risen by about a foot and a half, compared to about eight inches in the global average. This difference is largely due to two factors. The natural subsidence of their land by about seven inches over this time period, which is a result of the fact that the land was deformed when there was a giant ice sheet sitting um, you know, as far south uh, in North America as New York City. Um, and then that seven inches was further enhanced by the effects of groundwater withdrawal along the Jersey Shore, which causes, basically sucks the water out of the, the sand that constitutes the topmost layer of shore sediments and causes that sediment to sink. This 18 inches of sea level rise is already having very real effects here in New Jersey. It's making high tide flooding more common. This is a, a picture of a high tide flood um, from Ventor, New Jersey that was captured as part of a citizen science project run by Rutgers Jack Cousteau National Estuarine Research Reserve. And what the data show is that the number of high tide flooding days in Atlantic City have increased from less than one per year in the 1950s on average to an average of eight per year over the last decade a period of, uh, set over which sea level rose by about nine inches in total. 
and sea level rise is enhancing the fact that the effects of storm-driven flooding as well. This is a photo of FDR Drive um, from an event I think most of us remember very well, uh, Hurricane Sandy. And in work with our colleagues at Climate Central in Princeton, um, we found that human-caused sea level rise was responsible for about 18%, or about $11 billion of the Sandy recovery costs in New York and New Jersey, and exposed about 100,000 people who wouldn't otherwise have been exposed to Sandy's flooding. And work we've done with colleagues at Berkeley, uh, the University of Chicago, and the Rhodium Group, and this is a report that was released last year called New Jersey's Rising Coastal Risk. We found that due to sea level rise, about 27,000 more New Jersey properties experience flooding at least once a year than would have in the 1980s. And this bar chart is um, showing you the, how that breaks down by different coastal counties. Um, and we've also found that due to sea level rise and the effects of climate change, New Jersey's average annual losses from hurricanes have increased by about a billion dollars since the 1980s. About 600,000 New Jerseyans, roughly 7% of the total state population, live within about 10 feet or 3 meters of the high tide line. Areas that are potentially vulnerable to the effects of sea level rise and coastal storms over the next century. This is an area that currently houses about $190 billion of property. So knowing what's happening and why and what might happen in the future is a critical issue for planning for this state. So what's driving sea level rise? At a global scale, shrinking ice sheets and glaciers are responsible for a majority of the three inches of sea level rise that have occurred um, since 1993, about one and a half inches in total. This photo here um, is showing you an uh, edge where the, a part of the Greenland ice sheet reaches uh, the ocean, contributing to sea level rise there. And this cliff here um, is probably close to about 100 feet high. So this is a very large scale we're seeing. When you look at where specifically the ice loss is happening, um, so Greenland, there's been about half an inch of sea level rise since 1993. And it's important to keep in mind the scale of the numbers involved here. To raise sea level by about a tenth of an inch requires melting about a trillion tons of ice. So we're talking about five trillion tons of ice lost in Greenland since 1993. The areas in red are showing you where that mass loss has occurred. The areas uh, in, in blue are areas where there's actually been gain because the wetter atmosphere leads to more snowfall. Uh, in Antarctica, we've seen a contribution of about three-tenths of an inch since 1993, concentrated in this area here known as Swates Glaciers. But actually the largest term, single term, is not either of the two polar ice sheets, it's the mountain glaciers that are spread all over the world that have contributed about seven-tenths of an inch since 1993. But the potential for sea level rise from land ice loss is much larger. So even though glaciers dominate today, what we're really concerned about as we look to the future is the future of the ice sheets. Why? Well, if we account for all of the ice locked up in the ice sheets, there's roughly one foot of sea level rise equivalent in all the glaciers if you were to melt all of them. If you were to melt the entire Greenland ice sheet, it would contribute about 23 feet to sea level rise. If you were to melt the entire West Antarctic ice sheet, it would contribute about 16 feet. And if you were to melt uh, the East Antarctic ice sheet, which by and large is relatively stable and not likely to be lost for millennia, um, that would add about 170 feet to sea level rise. So you can see why we are concerned as scientists about the long-term stability of the ice sheets. And that's a question I'll come back to later. So ice sheets are responsible for about half of global average sea level rise. What's the other half? Well, about 40% uh, happens because the oceans expands in volume as it warms, uh, shown here as density changes. And this is just a simple physical relationship. But the oceans, right, they're the big heat sink for the planet. As we trap more heat on the planet with our greenhouse gases, the ocean takes up heat and it expands. And then roughly 10% is due to changes in the amount of water stored on land. When we pump groundwater out of the of aquifers and let it run into the ocean, that raises sea level. When we build dams, it actually holds water back on land, um, and that contributes a rel. This is a relatively small term, uh, but not insignificant. That's the global story. When we start looking at specific places, like here in New Jersey, the story becomes more complex. So over 1993 to 2017, the period over which global average sea level rose by about three inches, we've experienced nearly 
four, uh, five inches of sea level rise here in New Jersey. About 1.3 inches is due to that global average expansion of the ocean as it takes up heat. About 2.3 inches, as I mentioned before, is due to the sinking of the land due to both natural processes, the response to the end of the last ice age, and human processes, pumping out groundwater, causing the sand to compress under its own weight. About 0.9 inches is due to the effect of ice melting, and you'll note that that's less than the global average. Um, and the reason why that's less than the global average has to do with the fact that we are talking about these huge amounts of ice, trillions of tons. Uh, and when you move trillions of tons around, you actually change Earth's gravitational field. So near an ice sheet, and we're relatively near the Greenland ice sheet, and we're relatively near things like Alaskan glaciers, you actually get less sea level rise and farther away because you've removed a mass that was pulling water towards it. And so you get more sea level further away from the ice sheet. Looking forward, that means we get less than the global average sea level rise when Greenland melts, but we get more than the global average when the Antarctic melts. And then there's about 0.3 inches remaining. Um, that's a little harder to break down, but that's due to a combination of changes in winds and currents, as well as the effects of changes in the amount of water stored on land. So if that's what's happening right now, what can we anticipate in the future? Well, to project what may happen in the future, we need to look at all of those processes we've looked at to explain what's happened in the past. So how do we figure out vertical land motions? Well, in our framework, typically what we do is just look at what's happened in the past and assume that you know, some of those processes are geological processes that have been going on for thousands of years, and we can just assume we'll continue, and we look so that's the response to the end of the last ice age. And then there's a contribution from things like uh, subsidence, that the sinking of the land that's caused by groundwater withdrawal. And we, the best we can do is just extrapolate that forward as well. But that is something that is to some extent under direct control and might change. Uh, for the global effect of things like, impound, uh, like dam construction and groundwater pumping, uh, what we tend to do is look at how the global demand for dams and for groundwater have related to population and use population projections for the future. For the change in the density of the ocean and the change in ocean circulation, so currents in the ocean and the change in, in ocean atmosphere interactions having to do with the wind, that's the bit that the climate models that, that we use to project sort of regional climate changes do a pretty decent job at. So they're the primary source of information there. Um, but the ice sheets are hard, and so we have to turn to a variety of methods there, including looking at results from ice sheet models, but also things like um, using formal methods for assessing expert judgment to take into account things that the models might be missing. Um, and so we deal with this by using a variety of different approaches and saying, looking at how sensitive our projections are to different ways of projecting future changes in the ice sheets. Now, our framework with various modifications has been widely used in US stakeholder-driven assessments. That's not originally why we created it. Originally, we created it um, with, as part of a project called the Risky Business Project um, that was trying to do an economic risk assess analysis for the United States of the impacts of climate change broadly. Uh, but in order to do that, we needed a system that produced um, assessments of how likely different amounts of sea level rise are under different sets of emissions assumptions and ice sheets assumptions, and um, then use those to drive a risk model. And in order to do that, though, we needed local projections. And it turned out when we made a tool for making local projections, there turned out to be a lot of people who really wanted such a tool. And so our sea level rise projections produced here at Rutgers have ended up underlying state level assessments throughout the US, Washington, Oregon, California, Maryland, Delaware, um, New Jersey, uh, Boston and, and greater Boston, and playing a significant role uh, in the fourth national climate assessment. Now, we're going to have a broad spread of projections when we look to the future. Why? Well, particularly for global average sea level, there's two main drivers of that spread. So the longest spread, the largest spread, particularly in the longer term, is a range of possible future human emissions. So this figure here is showing you some scenarios of possible future greenhouse gas emissions um, from a group called Climate Action Tracker. Um, in this gray area here, and here, sorry, this is in billions of tons of carbon dioxide a year, 
um, and including not just CO2, which is around 42 billion tons, but the effects of other greenhouse gases were around 50 billion tons a year now. Under a baseline scenario where sort of the growth trends in carbon dioxide emissions of the 1990s and the 2000s continued, we might be looking at more than a doubling of greenhouse gas emissions in the second half of the century, leading to warming in the range of about 4 to 5 degrees Celsius, um, about 7 to almost 10 degrees Fahrenheit above the pre-industrial level uh, by the end of the century. Fortunately, we don't seem to be on that trajectory, partially as a result of policy, partially as a result of market dynamics. Solar prices, uh, for instance, have come down far more rapidly than most experts thought a decade ago. And the combination of market forces and policies means that most people think we're sort of on track for something that looks like that sort of blue path, a leveling out of emissions into the future. We hope, fingers crossed. And if we are on that trajectory, if we are on that trajectory, um, then the most likely warming by the end of the century is around three degrees Celsius or about five degrees Fahrenheit, which is a lot better than say, 7 to 10 degrees Fahrenheit, um, but is still a pretty risky amount. And far above what the nations of the world have set as their actual goal. Um, in the 2015 Paris Agreement, uh, we said the world set the goal of limiting warming to well below 2 degrees Celsius, 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit, and aiming for as close as possible to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Uh, keeping in mind that we're already at about 1.1 degrees Celsius, so that's not leaving us very much uh, warming left. Indeed, to get on these ambitious trajectories, uh, we need to have a decline in global greenhouse gas emissions starting now, uh, leading uh, in, in many projections to a net removal of greenhouse gases from the atmosphere as a result of things like carbon capture um, in the last quarter of the century. Uh, but these yellow and green trajectories would be trajectories consistent with those global goals compared to this blue trajectory, which is where we are now. So this spread here and possible future warming is a key driver of spread and future sea level. Another key driver of the range of projections is the incomplete, rapidly evolving scientific understanding of how ice sheets and the ocean interact. This is a really complex area where physical processes happening at a relatively small scale can have consequences that rebound at a continental scale. Um, And so particularly under higher emission scenarios, it becomes quite hard to figure out how particularly the Antarctic ice sheet um, is going to respond to warming. You know, there are some, some projections that predict that it could contribute multiple feats to sea level rise in this century under a higher emission scenario. And so we have to rely on a variety of models and a variety of approaches to capture that. And so We looked across the literature last year when we did this assessment in New Jersey, and we came to a couple of conclusions. First, through 2050, we are likely looking about one to two feet of sea level rise in New Jersey, regardless of emissions. This table here is part of the key table in our report, which is showing you um, the the rows representing uh, different estimates of the likelihood of how how high sea levels are. So this low end row, row means Across the approaches we use to look at projections, there's all of them agree that there's a 95% chance or more that we will exceed this level of sea level rise relative to the year 2000. So this would be 0.7 feet by 2050. This high end chance means all of the approaches, including approaches taking into account different ways of treating the ice sheet, agree that there would be at least a 95% chance we will be below this level, 2.6 feet. And all of the approaches agree that there's at least a two and three chance we'll be in this likely range here. So at least two and three chance that by 2050 we'll be between about 0.9 and 2.1 feet of sea level rise relative to the year 2000 in New Jersey. Now, beyond 2050, as we've already alluded to, projected rise is increasingly sensitive to levels of emissions, especially at the high end, where higher emissions run the risk of pushing ice sheets into behaviors unlike those they've experienced in the recent past. Um, So we're looking here at three different emission scenarios. The high-end one, that's similar to that baseline scenario, the four to five degrees Celsius of warming um, on the last plot. The low-end one, sort of consistent with the two degrees C target, and a moderate target emission scenario that's in between there, sort of consistent with current policy projections, assuming that there's no change in policy, and also assuming there's not um, 
any new feedbacks that we haven't anticipated that kick in and cause a planet to warm uh, faster than we think likely. So, um, you know, looking across these numbers, sort of why under the low emission scenario where we're consistent with the Paris Agreement targets, we're sort of looking at a bit over one feet to a bit under three feet of sea level rise being likely by 2070. Under the high emission scenario, it's more like one and a half to four feet. Uh, and then by 2100, you know, we're, we're looking at a little over, a little under two feet on the low emission scenario at the lower end um, to four feet under low emission scenario, about two to six feet under the high emission scenario. And then I want to draw your attention to this high end risk, right? So some of the projections would say that under a moderate emissions trajectory, um, there's a 5% chance we could see as much as seven feet of sea level rise in New Jersey, even though it's likely will be between two and a half feet of lives in this scenario. Whereas under the low emissions trajectory, we chop off two feet at the high end. So there's more than a 95% chance that we would be below five feet. Now, sea level rise does not stop in 2100, even though we often see climate projections end in 2100. And when we think about things like infrastructure, it's important we keep that in mind. 2100 keeps getting closer. Um, we're building, you know, the, the bridges underneath the Hudson River that, or sorry, tunnels underneath the Hudson River that need replacement have been there for more than a century. So infrastructure lasts a long time. And so it's important to look beyond and see, okay, well, when we look to 2150, uh, you know, even under a low emission scenario, there's a chance we might have to be planning for eight feet of sea level rise. So those projected increases in sea level translate into more frequent flooding. So here we're looking at that tidal flooding I mentioned earlier. Um, in 2010, in a typical year, we've got around seven days a year of tidal flooding um, in Atlantic City. Uh, by 2050, even under sort of the likely range scenarios, we're looking at somewhere between about 45 days and 255 days of that tidal or nuisance flooding um, in Atlantic City. So, so we have to think and realize even sort of middle of the roads projections are causing fairly rapid increases in frequency of tidal flooding. So we really have to learn how to live with that well. Um, you know, it's one thing if you just have to move your car out of the way five or seven days a year. If we um, have to move our cars out of the way 120 days a year, right, we, we really have to start thinking about the, the structure of our, of our towns. Um, and then carrying forward, um, you know, by the end of the century, uh, under even this moderate projection, what we would now consider a, high, a, a minor tidal flood may become the new normal. So what else do we see? Well, in our study with Rhodium Group, we found that about 90,000 properties worth about $80 billion that are not currently in the one in 30 year hurricane floodplain will enter the hurricane floodplain by 2050 as a result of, of sea level rise um, and changes in hurricane. And this figure here is showing you um, the, where, where those buildings are today and how many more there will be uh, by 2050. And we can just, when we, when we think about this effect, one useful way to think about it is to say, okay, well, what's the sea level rise? And then what's the water level we might concern about or find salient today? So here we look, look at expected number of, of flood events in New York City where we're focusing on the 10% annual probability extreme sea level event. So that's the one in 10 year flood effectively which is 3.3 feet above the high tide line. So here we're looking under a moderate emission scenario uh, and a projection in the center of the likely range for the moderate emission scenario. So this would be 1.4 feet by 2050, 3.3 feet by 2100. Well, in the year 2000, this 3.3 foot event was the one in 10 year event. So it had a 10% chance of happening per year. By 2030, with the sea level rise projected through then, that is enough to make the what was once the one in 10 year event, the annual high maximum high water level. So it's occurring about 10 times more frequently. By 2055, um, it's enough to make that the minor tidal flooding level. So we've gone from one in 10 years on average in the year 2000 to about five to 10 days per year in the 2050s. And then by 2100, you know, we have 3.3 feet of sea level rise. That means that 3.3 foot event, which was one in 10 years, is now a permanent flooding event. But this is sort of center of the road. What if we're in those high end projections, which we might want to worry about if we were concerned about critical infrastructure, say? Well, 
So in the high end projections, that's 2.6 feet by 2050, 6.9 feet by 2100. And recall, so this is for a moderate emission scenario, but we think there's a 95% chance we would be below this. Um, well, in this case, you know, we would uh, have uh, by 2035, the one in 10 year flood turned into the minor tidal flooding level. And by 2065, that one in 10 year flood is now the new permanent state of affairs. So our fourth question, what do we do about this? Well, the first thing, as I've alluded to before, is that we need to think about the long term as well as the near term. The consequences of our decisions often last longer than we might initially think. One example, of course, we're all familiar with is the Hudson River um, train tunnels, which are desperately now in need of uh, replacement, which are over 100 years old. But here's another example. So this photo here, taken from the Electric Railway Journal of 1911, um, is a photo of the Marion Power Station in Jersey City. So this is one of those early generations of power plants. It was built by the Public Service Electric Company, so PSE&G's predecessor in 1905, um, and it was replaced by the Hudson Generating Station in, 1960s, in the 1960s and closed in 2017. Now, here is that Electric Railway Journal article I want you to look over here on the right. This is a map of the electric grid in New Jersey um, in 1911. So it's showing you the stations. And there is the Marion switch uh, uh, station. And you can see the transmission lines here as well. Now, this map here shows in the red stars seven of the 14 switching stations, the locations of seven of the 14 switching stations that flooded during Sandy and were in significant part responsible for the two weeks without power that many of us experienced then. Um, so the, the, the structure of the electric grid was set in part by decisions made before 1910, and those had consequences in 2012 on our vulnerability. So that's think why we need to be so careful in thinking about these longer timescales. When we think about infrastructure, 100 years actually does matter. And decisions we make today can have consequences lasting on those timescales. So what do we do? Well, one option would be to rebuild after each event, essentially unchanged, maybe even gentrify a little, drive up the property values, and assume that the rest of the country will continue to subsidize that indefinitely through things like flood insurance and disaster relief. As you might expect, that's not necessarily what I would advocate. Uh, another approach would be what we would call accommodation. So say, okay, well, there's going to be more frequent flooding. Um, how do we make sure that those same minor tidal flooding events happening for a month and a half per year, um, that those essentially cause no damage? And sort of the iconic example of that would be something like elevating a house. So here's a, a photo from the Times from Manasquan. Uh, you know, the guy has made himself a nice garage by elevating his house, giving himself a, a better view, um, and also meaning that it's only, uh, only the, the car there that's exposed. Um, but it's important to remember, like we think about, say, elevating houses as a building level, but all of those buildings are dependent upon infrastructure. So if so, we're gonna make decisions to accommodate, we have to make sure it's not just that elevating the buildings, but also that we are hardening things like the sewer system, um, making the electric system more resilient so that you're not, say, not flooded and up in your nice third floor of your house, but also that you have functioning uh, sewage and water and electricity. So that's one approach. Um, another approach is sort of hard to harden and protect, build protective structures. Um, so this is a visual of the East Side Coastal Resiliency Project going on on the East Side. And the idea here is to, to put in place a variety of reasonably attractive um, barriers uh, to, to floodwaters um, to help keep the floodwaters over here when the ocean rises. Um, and this is a much more elaborate version of essentially what we try to do along the Jersey Shore. Uh, with sand dunes, and also you know the, you can put in place tidal uh, 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 surge barriers um, and things like that, uh, and that can be effective. Uh, but we also have to bear in mind the lessons of New Orleans, which has been projected by Dykes. Um, hard protection, protective structures can fail, and so when you build hard protective structures, you also need to have your contingency plans for what you do 
if things don't work. Uh, we can think about expanding protective natural infrastructure. So things like salt marshes and oyster beds. Um, here's an example of an oyster bed in Jamaica Bay. Those can be a very effective at dampening wave energy, uh, which is a significant contributor to the damage caused uh, when the surge comes in. Although they're less effective um, at dealing with permanent uh, uh, high tide flooding. So, you know, salt, salt marshes, for instance, can actually ac uh, accumulate sediments and keep up to some extent with sea level rise, uh, but they have to have an adequate sediment supply. Um, and they also have to be able to move back away from the shore. Uh, and in many cases, we have also pinned them in with things like, like roads. Um, so protective national infrastructure, part of the solution, but in many cases, it may be better at dealing with the wave energy than dealing with the longer term high water levels. Um, and the fourth choice is relocation. Um, there were a number of communities uh, that took, uh, for instance, Staten Island community at level buyouts after Hurricane Sandy. We've also had some buyouts um, at, a, at a multi-property level in places like Woodbridge. Um, and so this ultimately is an option if you're seeing areas where uh, you know, you're, the, the costs of rebuilding or protecting or making yourself more resilient exceed uh, the benefits, you know, there we have tools like Blue Acres to help encourage people to move out of way. But as great as Blue Acres is as a model, it's also important to care in mind that, bear in mind that since Sandy, we've seen about 10, 10 times as much new construction in the future floodplain as we've seen uh, buyouts. So those are a lot of choices. One of the things we're working on here at Rutgers um, is a question of how do we combine these different options, particularly dealing with the fact that, you know, there's a broad range of those projections having to do, as I said, with both uncertainty in future emissions and uncertainty in ice sheet behavior, right? You don't necessarily want to plan as though uh, high emissions and a very unstable ice sheet are a certainty, but you also don't want to ignore that possibility. Um, and so there's a set of approaches that are being developed called our flexible adaptation pathways. And the key here is to say, okay, well, um, what strategies do we have available to us? How do those uh, impact uh, the things we care about? Uh, when would we need to make a choice to move from one strategy to another? What indicators can we use? Is it an indicator of, say, global sea level change of something happening in Antarctica? Is it an indicator of frequency of flooding here? What sort of frequencies, uh, uh, what sort of flooding um, indicators, what sort of, of risk indicators do we have that would tell us we need to switch? Um, you know, for example, in this uh, example um, from, the, from this study, which is from Australia, um, you know, where do we switch from having no policy to changing building regulations to building a barrier? When do we have to do those uh, under different futures? So that's sort of adaptive contingency planning is a key approach. What we're trying to do now at Rutgers is take this sort of flexible approaches, which has largely been engineering driven, saying, looking at, okay, where do we um, upgrade our surge barrier and not consider the fact that we have human and natural systems evolving with one another, right? People are moving to or from the coast and will those and markets are shifting as a result of things like um, uh, changing flood frequency. And those sort of larger scale migration patterns um, and relocation patterns aren't necessarily taken into account. And we need to take those into account when we think about what are possible flexible futures. These have also sort of not generally considered um, the political economy. They assume that we have some me governance mechanism uh, for implementing these uh, trajectories. And so that's another important area that we're trying to build about and think about here at Rutgers. Um, and then I think the third thing is, right, that these uh, adaptation pathways uh, are all sort of negative. And what we also need to incorporate into these is a positive vision of what the coastal communities are going to be like in the future, right? We don't just want to have the question of what, basically being how do we postpone um, moving out, but what is, the, what is the coastal community we're building? And we have lots of stuff going on there, right? We have offshore wind as an important driver of coastal development. How does that intersect with sea level rise? How do fisheries and tourism, how do those interact? So what we're trying to do at Rutgers is really take this sort of flexible adaptation pathways approach and think about, well, what are the flexible transformation pathways? When 
do we have to relocate, but also what else can we do along the way? And what are the indicators so that we don't relocate prematurely, but also don't keep people in harm's way uh, unnecessarily? So one element of being able to do that is having the right scientific infrastructure, right? We need to have a scientific community uh, that can provide expertise to people on the ground, to, to, to low communities, to residents, to policymakers, that is, has a few characteristics that have been identified as the characteristics of usable science. Right? So these are things like, we need the science to be trusted by stakeholders as credible. We need to be answering questions that are relevant to the decisions pe people are making. And we need to be producing the science in a legitimate manner that's respectful of stakeholders' divergent values and beliefs. So one of the things, for instance, with our sea level assessment is that it's not just a group of scientists sitting together and trying to figure out what the answer is. We actually have an iterative process where we bring in stakeholders, get their feedback on, the, on, on what we're saying so we make sure that we are actually answering the right question. So that's also the iterativity aspect, right? The, the scientists and stakeholders need to interact. We need to, we as scientists need to make sure that we, you as stakeholders uh, are, are, are bringing the questions to us and we're answering in, in a useful way. And boundary organizations play a key role in this and as well as in building new linkages among stakeholders. And one example of such a boundary organization is the group that have brought us here together today, the New Jersey Climate Change Resource Center. Um, so I think, uh, you know, with, with, with graciousness to our, our hosts, that having institutions like the Climate Change Resource Center that people throughout the state and all sectors can turn to for a source of relevant, legitimate, incredible scientific information about climate change is going to be a key tool um, as we try to move the state forward in a, in a, in a space of rapidly changing climate. But I also want to just flag another thing that's very important uh, for the Climate Change Resource Center to take into account, right? We can have legitimate, credible, um, relevant science, but we also want to make sure that science is used in a manner to promote just, equitable, and effective adaptation outcomes. And there are plenty of examples. This, this table is from uh, uh, a book by Sovacool and Leonard of cases where adaptation has not necessarily done that. Where, say, instance, this, for instance, in post-Katrina New Orleans, adaptation methods have been implemented in a way that excludes women and minority voices, that relax environmental standards leading to harm to, to, to poor communities, um, that disproportionately benefit whiter and wealthier neighborhoods. Um, and so this element of justice and equity is something that we need to make sure is present and these interactions between scientists and stakeholders and is built into the infrastructure to promote and advance adaptive uh, decision making. So we had a, a paper uh, that came out last year um, sort of looking across all of these issues on both the physical science side and the decision science side. Uh, and I wanted to highlight a few key, couple key conclusions that came to us from this paper at the embarrassment of, of quoting myself. First point, decision science, the question of the science of how we make decisions, can become isolated from real decisions if the decision process is treated as though it were separate from the affected system. We have to think about political economy. This is as much a part of the dynamic coast as geomorphology, as human migration and market economics. So when we think about designing institutions to link science and adaptive decision making, we do have to account for what power relationships we're feeding into and how those power relationships affect the efficacy and equity of adaptation. Point two, this is more what I the call to the scientists. For sea level science to become actionable, we need to have the sea level scientists working intimately with the people studying the impacts of sea level change, with the social scientists who understand, study the decision processors, with the decision makers, and with the affected populations. That doesn't mean there aren't a lot of important questions to be answered about the fundamental physical science of sea level change. But it does mean that we can't just be doing curiosity-driven science. We also have to be doing science and educating the next generation of sea level scientists in a manner that has dialogue with non-specialists, with stakeholders, has a fundamental element. And that's something we're trying to do here at Rutgers through our Coastal Climate Risk and Resilience graduate training initiative, which is entering 
um, its fifth year now, uh, where we take students from across a variety of disciplines, um, you know, sea level scientists, engineers, urban planners, geographers, um, and get them to work with one another and get them to work uh, with coastal communities uh, to help develop resilience plans. Um, and I think it's been a pretty good uh, success. Uh, but I think it's something that, that we really need to continue to push forward. Um, and I hope, um, you know, if any of you are interested in partnering with us, uh, that you reach out to us and, and to Jean and Marjorie um, about that. However we choose to examine, though, I think we need to remember that the starting point has to be mitigation. It has to be reducing our emissions. Um, so this figure here is focusing on those emissions reductions, but focusing in on the period over the next decade, right? So here is where we are, current policies leading to a slow increase in emissions. To be between one and a half and two degrees Celsius, we have to be on these decline trajectories. So if we want to be consistent with the Paris Agreement goals, we have to have roughly a 20% reduction in greenhouse emissions, at least over the course of the next decade. So it's a substantial task. We can't just push that to the side and focus exclusively on adaptation. Now, regardless of emissions, as we talked about before, because ice sheets are big and slow moving systems, because the ocean is big and slow moving, uh, it'll take a few decades and before we see the benefits in terms of sea level rise. We'll see the benefits in terms of things like extreme heat sooner. Regardless of emissions, we're looking at a likely in sea level rise along the Jersey Shore of about one to two feet between 2000 and 2050. But beyond that, we start to see significant divergence. Under current emissions, we're looking at a likely range of about two to five feet of sea level rise by 2100, but that high end number of seven feet is in within the realm of possibility. Under a Paris compatible target, we're looking at more like one and a half to four feet by 2100, and the high end numbers brought down from seven feet to five feet. So there's a lot we can do through reducing our emissions, and emissions reductions will help, help not just with these sea level harms, but with many others. There's also a lot baked in that we have to adapt to. So this is an important dialogue. We need important partners like the Climate Change Resource Center. We need networks like the Climate Change, um, New Jersey Climate Change Alliance uh, that brings in stakeholders. Um, and we need to think about political economy. Um, so we need all of that. And we need that dialogue urgently. And it needs to be on um, the agenda. So it's everybody who cares about the future of the coast in New Jersey. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, to Professor Kopp for loading up that wonderful talk. Bob's here with us live. Uh, great to see you. And I'm going to turn it over actually to my colleague, Dr. Carrie Ferraro, who's been checking the chat box. We have just a few minutes. So if anyone else has a question, type it in now quickly. And Carrie, get, I'm going to turn it over to you so we can maximize our time. Great. Thanks, Marjorie, and uh, thank you, Dr. Kopp, for a, a wonderful talk. Um, we had one question from Mike Alcott, who asked if you've seen the recent study by Dowdswell et al. in Science um, that suggests that Antarctic ice shelf retreat 14,000 years ago was 100 times as fast as the average over the last 10,000 years. And if you have seen this, have you ha do you have any comments about that paper? Um, so I only read it very quickly. I mean, I think the punchline is that they find evidence during a period that is quite different uh, than today, the end of the last ice age, um, where the edge of the ice sheet in some region was retreating at a weight faster than about 10 kilometers per year. And so that um, is something that, well, first of all, there, there are questions, I think, with the geological data um that will have to be addressed in the, in the literature but 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 if that is true right if we're seeing rates of 10 kilometers a year that's also comparable to sort of the fastest rates of retreat we see in much smaller areas in greenland um and it does raise the possibility that some of those high-end numbers in our analyses um might be more likely under a high emission scenario than yeah so main sort of middle of the road consensus numbers would suggest but i think it really just points to um, the fact that this is a rapidly evolving scientific area. Thank you. Um, our next question uh, from John Callahan asks: If global warming stopped tomorrow, how long would we expect to see? We would, it would be expected. I'm sorry, sea levels to continue to increase. 
Uh, that is a great question. Um, and to some extent, it depends upon um, how, how much, well, if we're saying literally stop tomorrow rather than stop at some, arbitrarily at some point in the room or future, um, what we would certainly expect sea levels to continue and to increase for centuries and, and probably millennia. Um, but our best estimate is that, you know, if we were to stop now, the total amount of sea level rise might actually be a manageable amount. Um, best estimates are roughly that until we get to about two degrees Celsius of warming, we're probably looking at about six feet of sea level rise per um, one degree Celsius of warming. So right now, if we were to really stop, we might expect sea level to continue rising at a rate comparable um, to its current rate or, or more or less uh, until we got to about six feet of sea level rise total. So maybe about 600 years. But you know, if we go up to two degrees C, then it, we're, we're sort of baking in probably more like about uh, uh, four meters or 12 feet of, of sea level rise. Um, our next question is from Rick Bushnell, who asks um, how familiar you are with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers studies and plans for the Back Bay Protection Plan, um, and whether there's a concern that the engineers will take the worst case and say that to protect life you have to build that and press hardscaping, no matter what the data might say, basically choosing hardscaping, and uh, especially what we realize it, uh, yeah, the, well, when we look at the economic benefits. Um, so I'm moderately familiar with the Army Corps studies, not not deeply familiar. Um, you know, I think we have to we have to look at this, I think, very seriously and and, and um, holistically. I don't think we can just come at it as like hardscaping, as you call it, or hard protection um, is always the right uh, solution. Um, and you can sort of see that even if you look at places like Long Beach Island today, you can see the areas that have been inhabited uh, and where there's been beach replenishment going on for a long time is it's almost detached from the southernmost part of the island. Um, and we really have to make sure when we think about hardscaping that, we're, that we are looking at um, you know, the effects of sea level rise and also the effects of how, um, when we're talking about uh, particularly about, about the barrier islands, but, but more broadly about how the coast is going to change in response to um, storms and sea level rise. Um, there's a lot of analyses that look at the coast as though it's sort of fixed in place, um, and that's um, not not adequate. We need we need to, to look more at sort of that uh, dynamic response. Thank you. Um, and a kind of related note, um, Judy Weiss asked uh, regarding, or, or she she made a comment that regarding salt salt marshes in New Jersey, very few are keeping up with the current level of sea level rise. Um, and that migration inland is impossible for many. Right. She used the example of Route One and coastal towns. Do you have a comment on that? Or? Uh, no, I, I, I was just say I also have to apologize. Watching the clock, I have a hard stop in, in three minutes, so I apologize to anybody whose questions we we don't get to. Uh. Um, and so then the last question um, is just uh, from Susan Landau. And as sea level rises, does inland groundwater level rise at a similar rate? Um, again, that, that depends, um, but in many cases we do have saltwater intrusion has uh, live ocean water as, a, as an important uh, um, problem. Uh, it, is, it depends on the hydraulic uh, situation. Um, I do want to actually, because I have one more minute, I want to take a couple of other questions that I see uh, were sent uh, to me. Um, so one, uh, you, who, this question is basically who should be doing this, state, county, or city? Um, and I think really we we need all of those involved, uh, and and the federal government needs to be taking a leadership role as well. Um, you know there are decisions having to do with land use that are local decision making, um, but you also like we can't we can't be making these decisions solely as 170 different coastal communities in New Jersey um, because they all interact with one another. Um, and uh, question about the time frame of um, projections. Uh, so the, the uh, national climate assessment is required by statute to go out 100 years, and it um, essentially always has. So I know there, there are some states where, where they decide to put on blinders at 2040, but that's not been true in New Jersey, and it's not true of the national climate assessment by statute. Um, there has been some discussion uh, by the current administration, perhaps, of trying to limit that, but that would be illegal. 
um, the, the National Climate Assessment has to go out a century by, by the 1992 statute that it established them. Thanks, Bob. That's uh, been tremendous. We, we're really grateful um, that you could join us today. We hope everybody here will um, join us for our next webinar in this series, which will be June 15th at noon, which, in which colleagues from the state of New Jersey's Historic Preservation Office, along with the nationally recognized historic preservation expert, Dominique Hawkins, will speak on protecting our historical and cultural assets from climate change. Um, you're also welcome to join us for a two-part workshop on rebuilding New Jersey after COVID-19 on June 12th and 17th. You can find the registration information and the details for these events on our website. Um, again, today's webinar has been recorded. As soon as we render it and post it to our website, we will send an email out to all of you who registered. Uh, and your questions have been very helpful to us in um, even those we couldn't address today in formulating where we'll be moving forward as a, as a center. So with that, I'd like to thank you all for joining us, and that concludes today's webinar.